I can't talk about Huel enough in my life, especially right now. And it's really interesting because what we tend to see at this time of year is the first thing that goes is our diet quickly followed by our fitness. And we see that in the data across multiple surveys. People in the fourth quarter of the year start indulging a little bit more, which is totally fine. And they start exercising a little bit less, which is totally fine. However, a really useful crutch during this period where the seasons have changed and we're starting to behave a little bit differently is making sure your fridge is stocked with things that are nutritionally complete, healthy, and that are going to be convenient for you to consume without compromising your health. And that is where, ladies and gentlemen, Huel comes in. And they now have four brand new flavours. They have the salted caramel flavour, absolutely love. They have the cinnamon swirl flavour, the number one new flavour in my opinion, which is really surprising. Iced coffee caramel, and they have the strawberries and cream flavour. If you're going to try any of the new flavours, please do try the cinnamon swirl and let me know what you think. It's an absolute unexpected champion of the new flavours. If you want to know something about yourself, sit on your bed one night and say, what's one thing I'm doing wrong that I know I'm doing wrong that I could fix that I would fix? You meditate on that, you'll get an answer. And it won't be one you want, but it'll be the necessary one. When you're trapped, some of it's your own inadequacy. What you can do to begin with is every bloody thing you possibly can do to put yourself in the most virtuous and powerful negotiating position possible. Wherever I go in the world, people come up to me and they often have a pretty rough story to relate. It's an awful thing. Because you see, even in the revelation of their triumph, the initial depth of their despair. So I wouldn't change that. But it's not nothing. It's certainly not just happiness. One of the things I was also really, really keen to ask you was about the... the, the what's happened in the world over the last two years. One of the shifts we've seen in the business world is this move to remote working. And I hate it. And I hate it for a variety of reasons because I feel like there's very few institutions in in, our, in my life where I have a chance to meaningfully connect with, with people. Dating has become screens. Socializing has become screens. And the office, the institution of the office in my life was one of the places, especially as a younger man, where I got to meet pretty much 90% of my current best friends and also partners. And, and I really worry about um, sitting behind a, a Zoom uh, doing my work um, for for the re- for the next ten years. What is your take on remote working? Well, I like it and I don't like it. For a lot of people, this is the first time, um, for a certain generation, this is the first time they've experienced such unpredictable tectonic um, uh, destabilization in their lives. Like we, I didn't even believe society was something that could close. I didn't believe the tech, there was, I didn't even know there was tectonic plates under my business that could shut down my business, right? What are the lessons we learn from the the pandemic and from that type of tectonic suffering about what actually matters in our lives? Well, we'll see with regard to the pandemic because although in some sense it is in some ways over, our reaction to it is by no means over. And part of the reason that we overreacted, I would say, so precipitously to it is that we were unprepared for such things in our naivety. You cannot predict how they're going to end. You have to run them. Well, you know, I believe that truth will save the world. I believe that. So you speak truthfully. And you watch what happens. And you take your consequences. You know, and maybe you hope and have some faith that in the final analysis... Things will work out in your favor, but perhaps they will and perhaps they won't. But that's faith, eh? That's faith. It's Faith isn't believing in things you regard as ridiculous, sacrificing your intellect. It's a decision, you know? Will truth, beauty, and love save the world? Well, you can find out. Thank you doesn't seem to quite cut it for the impact you've had even on me and also for giving me your time. This is actually useful in an argument with someone you love. They're, they're upset with you. What are your preconditions for satisfaction? Now, I wouldn't state it like that. It's like, if I could give you what you wanted right now in the context of this argument, and I wasn't doing it in a manipulative way, what is it that I would have to say or do that would in principle satisfy you? And that's a hard question, you know. And the person might say, well, I think you should apologize and 
about this and, you know, and, I, and then I will say, what words should I use? And they'll say, well, if you loved me, you'd know. And I would say, no, I'm stupid and ignorant and I don't know what the right words are to satisfy you. So why don't you give me a hand with that and I'll utter them inelegantly and awkwardly in a good faith demonstration of my commitment to peace. Jimmy Carr was on two weeks ago and we had a great conversation about um, happiness and the nature of happiness. And the guest before Jimmy Carr wrote in my diary, which is a tradition we have now where all the guests that come on write a question for the next guest. So there is mm. a question there for you. But th the guest wrote a question um, which changed his life, which is, um, are you happy? And I, from reading your work and understanding your position on happiness and it not being the thing to aim for, which really struck me because I thought, you know, the, I thought life was the North Star of our lives was to try and be happy. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I believe it's really difficult to truly connect some, with someone if you're not b speaking and being your truth. And I, I wasn't, I was, I, I think I was wearing a mask in my relationships in the context of I didn't express how I was thinking and feeling. I was trying to be who I thought my partner wanted me to be. And at the mm -hmm. point when I like, I let down the mask and I started speaking my truth. Unexp actually, as I was departing from the relationship, the relationship got stronger than ever before. And it was like we were never actually connected until I was being true with her, mm -hmm. with my feelings, with what I wanted, with my life. And since then, I, I would categorize my relationship as being the strongest thing I've ever seen in terms of a, a romantic connection with someone. And, and so when you were starting to talk in your relationship in a more truthful manner, what did that mean that you had to admit? And it turns out that not only is what we want from each other the real thing, but that's also the adventure of your life. And so if you aren't truthful, and that means, unfortunately, especially at the beginning, when you start to be truthful, it means deeply coming to terms with your inadequacies in humility. So it's very painful. Without that, you don't have the adventure of your life. You have the role that has been that you've acquiesced to. And that'll take all the meaning out of your life. The adventure of your life. That's the problem right there, is that, well, that, that I'm trying to get a hold of the Disney people at the moment because I want to do a lecture series on Pinocchio because I think Pinocchio is brilliant work of art. Um, and if you're a puppet and an actor, and Pinocchio is both, at times in that movie, both a puppet and an actor. So why an actor? Like, why is there, why is there something wrong with being an actor? Well, the first question is, well, who sets your role? And then the second question is, who's pulling your strings? And so in some sense, and this is part of the religious enterprise, you want a goal that you can never attain, right? So you can always move closer to the goal that recedes as you move towards it. But it's not because... As you pursue that goal, you put yourself together and your life does get better and richer and more abundant. And that's why the highest levels of virtue and goal are in some sense transcendent. You want them to be above everything you're doing so you can continually move towards something that's more sublime and better. That's what you are. You're, you're here to live, not to, not to sleep. And the problem with the vision of my ties on the beach is that, well, first of all, that's, an that's a vision of, of drug-induced unconsciousness. Second, it's only going to work for about a week. Well, that's not good. It's not just. It's not fair. It's, it's not meritorious. All of those things. Man, maybe you shouldn't be there. But what you can do to begin with is every bloody thing you possibly can do to put yourself in the most virtuous and powerful negotiating position possible. And you have to think like a snake in some sense to do that. You got to get the details right. You have to be prepared to bite and, and you have to have your eyes on the prize, so to speak. And people aren't taught this sort of thing ever, really. They're not taught how to negotiate. They're not taught how to goal set. They're not taught how to conceptualize appropriate success in some broad sense. In some sense, that's what the humanities are supposed to teach people. So, so you think maybe and everyone has this proclivity to some degree, is they're deeply um, self-conscious and uncertain. And so instead of allowing the person they're with to connect with that underlying uncertainty and inadequacy, they act out a persona. Yeah. And then the problem is, is that 
well, perhaps the person falls in love with that persona, but there's no real connection there. It's, it's an artifice. And so you need this, this functional shell. Mm. But the problem arises when that functional shell is all that there is. And then the real person underneath is just desperate and, and unhappy because nothing of what's being acted out reflects a true underlying reality. What is the consequence, the long-term consequence of acting? You aim to climb uphill to the highest peak you can possibly envision. And that's, that's better than happiness. Why did you include terribly? Well, for example, now when I go, wherever I go in the world, people come up to me and they're usually, I wouldn't say they're happy to see me. They're often in tears, you know, and they often have a pretty rough story to relate. You know, they were suicidal or nihilistic or homicidal or trapped, desperate. You know, and they tell me that real fast. And then they say, I've overcome that to a large degree and thank you for that. And The adventure of your life. You say, imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. Mm -hmm. Um I encounter these young people who appear to know who they could be or they, they've imagined who they could be, but for whatever reason, they seem to choose the certain misery of their current situation, the job that's sucking their soul out or that relationship um, over the uncertainty they'll encounter as they go on the adventure of their life. I have a bad relationship or a neutral relationship with my boss who doesn't know who I am. Um, I have problems with co-workers and that's demoralizing me. And it's also not good for you, you being my boss, because if I'm actually more valuable than is being recognized, then the fact that you're not valuing me properly means that I will become demoralized. I won't work properly and you won't get the best out of me. So it's bad for both of us. And if your boss is in principle not amenable to such a discussion, then what you should seriously consider doing is finding another job. Okay, so let's say we're going to set you up for this. Okay, this isn't like next week's enterprise, man. This is your life. So the first thing I would ask is, well, do you have your resume or CV in order? Well, I haven't typed it up for three years. And then they say, I've overcome that to a large degree and thank you for that. And, and you think, well, that's really something to have that happen over and over. In some ways you might think, well, how could anything better possibly happen to you? And to have people come up to you all over the world, strangers, and open themselves up like that, like their old friends, so quickly. But at the same po time, it's an awful thing. Because you see, even in the revelation of their triumph, the initial depth of their despair. So I wouldn't change that. But it's not nothing. <laughs> Let's look where the holes are. Let's look at where the inadequacies are as far as you're concerned, right? Let's walk through those judgments and see if they're warranted because maybe you're just too guilty and ashamed and self-conscious and anxious and you're not, you're looking at your resume more critically than someone else would. And maybe there's some holes that you need to rectify. You'd say, well, I, I came to terms with that six months ago and in an effort to rectify it, I'm taking the following courses and here's my plan for completion. That's a really good answer. And anyone with any sense who's interviewing will accept that as an indication that although you're not perfect and who is, that you have a good plan and that you've thought it through. Like, well, you have to have your CV and your resume in order. And you have to be able to stand on it solidly. And which at least means that you're prepared to address the inadequacies in a credible, realistic, believable, and truthful manner. It's sort of precognitive and instinctual, but it's also extremely sophisticated. And there's an element of transcendence about it, right? And so it's so interesting that we can criticize and elevate ourselves at the same time and that we find that intensely pleasurable. And so a good comedian collects ways to do that, shares them with the audience, and he's listening. And so if you want to help someone, the best way to help someone is not to give them advice, but to listen to them. So... So many people, especially because of the world I live in, in Instagram and social media, we, we kind of build out these personas and then yeah. we almost follow the implicit instructions that come with those personas. So you've put on this front that 
is there to make you popular and sexy and desirable and to mask from yourself your own inadequacies. But that's a role. Well, who wrote it? And for what purpose? Because at least you're attempting, in some sense, to adapt to the social world. Someone who's really infantile and dependent, someone who's never left home, part of their problem is that they haven't crafted a persona. So you don't want to denigrate it entirely, but it's no substitute for the real thing. Hmm. But I certainly wouldn't forego the technology, and neither would the rest of us. It's like people complain about their phones, but they carry them with them everywhere they go. And so it's not surprising that since it just de- appeared and it's so insanely powerful that we don't know what to do with it and that might even wreck everything like god only knows twitter itself could bring civilization to a halt we we don't know how to manage the unintended consequences of our technological prowess and it's almost impossible because of that ignorance to what the um the unintended consequences might be to predict them ahead of time so we we optimize and technology does alienate us because of its artificiality and its and its and its coldness and its mechanistic nature, all of that. And then you ask, well, how do you contend with things wisely? And I would say, well, don't pollute your thoughts with deceit. Conservatives tend to be more conscientious, so that's orderly and industrious, dutiful, patriotic, uh, willing to make and keep verbal contracts, reliable, capable of implementation at the level of detail. That's kind of conservative virtues there, but they tend to be lower in creativity, openness to experience. He said comedy is the most dialogical of of the entertainment forms. And I thought, well, what do you mean by that? I'm always talking to individual people in the audience and watching their reactions and listening to the audience as a whole. So even though it's a lecture, let's say, or a talk, I'm watching the audience and responding. So we're in a kind of dance. Well, Carr pointed out that comedians before they hit the road if you do that 200 times you have nothing but hilarious material but you listened and then you can go out on the road and that was very interesting to me because humor is a mysterious phenomenon experientially and conceptually and that's in some sense the highest form of humor and so a good comedian collects ways to do that shares them with the audience and he's listening such a great country this country such a profound place and it was so wonderful to see Cambridge and Oxford and to be welcomed by the students. and Watch the talk in, in Cambridge and um, it was so wonderful to see because, it, you know, I know that you don't do what you do for credit. That kind of seems to be, the, the, you know, the antithesis of the, the pursuing your truth and doing it for the, in the cause of truth. But um, it was so wonderful to see someone that I know has had such a profound impact on so many be received in such a way. We have a f- closing yeah. tradition. Um, okay. One of the, you know, I don't normally do this, but one of the, the really great c- CEOs in our country, a young guy, has built a multi-billion dollar company, really great guy, sat here yesterday and I actually told him for the first time who he's writing the question for and I couldn't believe his face. Oh my God, that's the one person I want to have dinner with. You know, when you listen to a profound piece of music, one that sort of spans the whole emotional experience, it's not happy. Happy is elevator music, and probably you just shouldn't listen to that at all. Right? And now what you see is this insistence on about a monthly basis that a new and radically different variant has emerged. And This virus, viruses mutate all the time, but this virus particularly mutates, and there are small mutations and medium-sized mutations, numbers, let's say, and also effect, and and larger-scale mutations. When is that a variant? Well, how about whenever it's convenient for the pharmaceutical companies? You think, well, that's cynical. It's Is it now? The biggest lawsuits in the history of the American judicial system have been levied against the largest pharmaceutical companies on a regular basis for the last 20 years. It's sweet, uh, simple, shallow, that's a problem. Um, It doesn't have that deep sense of awe and horror, I would say, that is characteristic of the best of all music. You know, you listen to some simple music, so-called. Hank Williams is a good example. You know, the blues cowboy from the 50s who died of alcoholism when he was 27 and whose voice sounds like an 80-year-old man. Simple melody, you know, but there's nothing simple in the song. And 
and in the voice. So even if it's unfair, you know, even if you're hemmed in for any number of reasons, inappropriate, like ethnically predicated oppression, let's say, or maybe you live, at, you're in a, a workplace that really is sexist in some fundamental sense. There's this admission of a deep suffering at the same time as you get the beautiful transcendence of the music. And that's meaning, you know, that's awful in the most fundamental sense. 